Hi, I'm Rachel Barton Pine, and welcome to the fourth episode of 24 in 24, Concertos from the Inside. Today, we're going to delve into the only concerto in the series by a composer born in America, Samuel Barber. In fact, this is the only American violin concerto to have achieved a place in the standard repertoire internationally. So a number of years ago, I had gone backstage to say hi to Perlman when he was playing it with the Chicago Symphony, and he said, yep, I'm playing the barber today. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, standard music joke, right? And so I said to my husband, you know, that would be pretty funny if an orchestra ever programmed the overture to Barber of Seville by Rossini and then the Samuel Barber violin concerto doing a barber and barber thing. And he's like, oh, that would be too silly. No orchestra would ever do that. Um, and finally, um, just recently, I soloed with an orchestra where they did indeed open with the um, Rossini overture and did barber and barber. So. Ha, ah, now my life has been fulfilled. Okay, well, let's jump right in. Um, I love the orchestration of this piece because it does use the piano as a symphonic instrument, and even the very first note has this wonderful piano chord that has such a, a richness of sound added to the strings and everybody. Um, and the soloist comes in right with the orchestra on the very first note with this incredibly warm, open sound. And it's a beautiful theme marked mezzo forte. And it kind of goes to the second measure. And then he doesn't mark detailed dynamics after that, but there really is, I think, a, a lowering down slightly so you have room. And then the second measure, third measure, fourth measure, and then finally the fifth measure, which goes all the way to there. Do this on the D string. On the G string, and that is my wolf. Well, one of my two wolves. Um, every good violin has a wolf, so. But I do it on the G string anyway, because I can't not. Um, and then. Now we have that same opening melody. And here we have it. Very different than mezzo forte. Now it's all the way down to piano. So like a lot of people, of course, I do it on the D string, but more importantly, instead of an open sound, I try to have a very covered sound, still projecting because it is a concerto on a big stage, but having a completely different color. So the exposition and recapitulation are each divided up into three distinct sections, very miniature in a way. Um, the next one is this with the hairpins. Now what's interesting is um, for all of the other measures, he goes one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, triple it, triple it, eighth plus quarter note making a triplet. But then he has a two eighth note duple um, the first time. And then a, a back to his triplet. And What's interesting is that that doesn't happen in the recapitulation, but it seems like too specific of a thing to have been a misprint. So was it a misprint that it didn't happen again in the recapitulation or what? I haven't ever laid my eyes on the source. Um, so it, it's kind of a mystery. Maybe he just wanted to, you know, a lot of times when composers seem like they're being inconsistent, it, they, they're doing it on purpose just to not do the same thing twice, which is often a good idea in music um, to have variety. Um, but I do love the duple because it seems more steady and stable da -da, where your first note is a little longer so it's like a little more um, laid back actually and then the one with the triple it seems like it has a little more impetus and since the passage is moving forward da -da, Da -da 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 -da. And then more so. Da -da 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 And then here's an interesting moment. If you saw your part in isolation, your solo part, you would be super tempted to retard into that final note. Um, that would be like the standard way we would interpret music if that was all you saw. To kind of 
have set up that last note, only it's actually an illusion because that is not the last note. That might be the soloist's last note, but it's not the section's last note. The orchestra has one more measure of triplets. And then back into uh, the variation of the original theme. And so actually, um, Barber writes Poco Writ in the orchestra's measure. So that's an especially good clue that you shouldn't retard into the retard. Um, but, you know, unless you kind of notice that, then you might be um, tempted to do the violinistic thing. Um, there's also another problem, which is that the original edition, um, and actually I'm going to ask my, my tech team to put this up on the screen so you can see this. So um, you're looking at the score right now, which does show the retard in that second bar. Um, but the solo part actually is missing that retired, or I should say the original edition of the solo part, because this was published in um, 1949, I think it was. It was completed in 1939, written in 1939, and then the publisher says it was copyrighted in 41 and then maybe 47, 49, I can't remember, 46. Anyway, um, and until just a few years ago, that was the only edition you could buy. Of course, it's out of copyright, in copyright, and so of course there's the one edition that you can get. And sadly, there are a number of significant misprints in this old edition um, that used to be the only edition of the solo part. And for many years, I didn't realize that. And then finally, one day when I was a teenager, I cracked open my orchestral score. I'm like, wait a sec, what's that? What's that? And I realized there was stuff missing from the solo part, including this Poco writ. It is actually in the old part um, the second time round in the, in the recapitulation. But anyway, that's an important piece of information to have. There were other tempo changes that were missing. And then things like rehearsal letters, numbers um, being absent, um, little dynamics that were absent, um, but important stuff to know about. So it's a good lesson to always study your score and always to check the violin line and compare it against the violin line. Sometimes there are edits, sometimes there are misprints, and you always want to know what's in the score because that's usually the most pure, and then you can use that as a jumping off point the development um, starts pianissimo, which is always a tricky dynamic in a, a solo part of a violin concerto, because how pianissimo do you go, really, when you're playing, you know, trying to be heard in a big hall all by yourself with an orchestra playing with you that's not a thick orchestration at this moment. So I try to, again, think about color, have a pianissimo quality. <laughs> Again, I let the, the line be not completely metronomic because there are no rhythmic things happening underneath me, though there is kind of a held drone. And um, this is a wonderful chance to, to really have a mysterious quality. And so that there is a different, if it said piano, I might be soft but more present. have this warmth and depth, but because it says pianissimo, I really do have to do something special. Now, that wasn't a pianissimo decibel level. If I did, if I was in the section of an orchestra and I did a pianissimo like that, I would deservedly be yelled at by the conductor for sticking out. Um, or chamber music, I would be pre a pretty rude colleague if that was my pianissimo. Um, but for a soloist, of course, it's like the equivalent of a stage whisper. If you're truly whispering to someone, you know, then you're telling them a secret. But if you're in a play in a big theater, you would be telling someone a secret. So you're whispering, but of course the audience can still hear you, but it still sounds like a whisper, not like normal speech. So that's a good equivalent to keep in mind when playing solo pianissimos, that it's a stage whisper. There's a wonderful percussion thing, or drums really. <laughs> so they're matching my rhythm. And then I'm doing a triplet, but they go duple, duple, triplet, as I do. So. I'm hearing that, that big drum thing. It's almost like a rock and roll moment. It's just awesome. And then I play these open G and D. It's one of those great, you know, kind of American sounding moments with a wide open fifth and the orchestra soaring. And then they play actually, that's right into the recapitulation, which the orchestra plays without me um, for the first iteration of, of the melody. And they do an expanded version. So instead of, da, ya, da, 
da 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 They go da 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 So it's just like ah, like squeezing every last ounce of whatever you can out of that theme, and it's just ah, so glorious. And then you get a little mini cadenza, um, no big full-fledged cadenza, but it's just you know kind of an improvisatory passage, not based. Maybe some theorist, theorist would um, figure out what it's how it relates to the body of the piece, but um, thematically, it's just not you know not obviously one or another um, musical motive. It's just a cadenza. Um, so this, and it's fortissimo. And what's interesting is he has a, a, a sibling of that same cadenza moment at the end of the second movement, but this one is only forte. Um, if you saw forte, you might think big, 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 but knowing that the previous cadenza was fortissimo, you know that this one is something a little bit less, and indeed it starts with slurs, which already tells you that it's not quite as forceful. And so I do this the second movement one much more singing. <laughs> ends big, unlike the first one that ended soft. This big growly thing that they do, which is so great. And there's a significant oboe solo, really gorgeous um, moment for the oboe, really the only one from the standard repertoire um, that I can think of, other than, of course, the big one in the Brahms Violin Concerto opening of the second movement. And then after the oboe does their thing, then the cellos come in. And this is a case of of historic performance practice. Now, normally when we say the words historic, we are historically informed performance or things like that. We think of gut strings, we think of music from the 1700s and stuff like that. But actually, um, there's a very specific way of playing stringed instruments from the early 1900s that people a um, hundred years later don't necessarily always do anymore. Um, and I'm talking about expressive slides, these really lush, juicy slides up and down. And you would have shifts that are overhand shifts, um, what we call the old finger, where you're shifting up on the finger you're already on. Or the new finger, the underhand shift. And going down, you only have one option, which is the old finger. And if you listen to old recordings, a good place to find this, by the way, is Hollywood soundtracks of the era, because those orchestras are so flavorful and so lush, and the concertmasters are sliding all over the place. And so if you hear the Barber Violin Concerto being played in a 21st century way, very clean, in a way that's actually losing something. It would be like doing a very dull movement of a Baroque, um, you know, a, a melodic Baroque passage with no ornaments. Um, you, you'd be missing something that's supposed to be there to decorate it. And those slides in a way are our ornaments. Now, it's kind of like a pendulum because players from the beginning of the, the 20th century used to slide all over everything, even when maybe they shouldn't. And, you know, they didn't really distinguish between periods as much as we do nowadays. So if they were playing Mozart, or, you know, they give a nice juicy slide. And now we're like, ah, it's Mozart. We should be clean. Um, but uh, so then people were like, oh, we're sliding too much. So then they started sliding maybe not enough. So the happy medium, of course, is to slide when it enhances the music and not to slide when it might kind of overwhelm the music um, and to do what's appropriate for the time that the piece was written. So the cellos have this wonderful lush melody that I have later and I'll often ask them to please, please, please put in some slides and they almost get this feeling of guilt on their on their faces like they're doing something naughty by being slidey but actually um, it's so pretty when they do it. Albert 
Spalding was the person who gave the professional premiere. And Albert Spalding, um, I like the fact that he was born in my hometown of Chicago. He was the greatest American violinist of the generation after Maude Powell, who was the greatest of her generation. And you might recognize the name Spalding from baseball. Indeed, this Albert Spalding was the nephew of the other Albert Spalding that started the Spalding Sporting Goods Company. And in fact, that Spalding was a pitcher and I married a pitcher, so there you go. So it starts with the timpani, which gives you this total sense of excitement. And then you come in. And the thing that, that I feel makes this movement interesting, so it's not just, oh, look at that violinist play fast, which can get boring after about 60 seconds, um, but to really bring out phrasing, rhythmic elements, and harmonies. So I'll, I'll show you a bit of what I'm talking about. <laughs> And then actually, if you guys could put this up on the screen, looking at the score is super important because there are certain phrase markings that Barbara didn't put in the solo part, but it's not a bad idea to kind of follow what the orchestra is doing. So, um, hmm. yeah, so here, a little crescendo. Back to this really exciting, slightly softer music. But the second time this happens, um, a few pages later, um, he does something totally different. He keeps the crescendo going. So you really can exaggerate like the difference between the first time. So there's another a nice harmony where it changes from minor key. Now it's in the friendly D major. A little phrase there. Now here's an echo that was missing from the original edition of the solo part. A pianissimo here with that F natural. So I actually changed my fingering. So I can stay on the D string for that little echo. Little hairpins. And then these fun hemiola. Triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So doing a lot with those. And one, one and two and three, often for this one, what I'll warm up is not the concerto, but the encore I play after the concerto. This being an American concerto, I love to take the opportunity to play something a little Americana flavored. So not just by an American composer, but something that sounds American. So like a Mark O'Connor Caprice, or um, you know maybe the last movement of David Wallace's Personas. Um, and so that's what I'll usually be doing is some fiddly sort of thing right before I go on stage. But since I'm not playing an encore today, no point in warming one up, and we'll just get right to the concerto.
Our last question comes from Grace. Hi, my name is Grace Collins. I'm a violin student at Oberlin Conservatory. My question is on Barber's Violin Concerto. This is one of my all-time favorite pieces, so I was curious what your relationship was like with this piece, as well as if you found any of the movements or the characters in the concerto to be influenced by anything that was happening culturally at the time that it was written. Okay, Grace, well, I'll speak to your second question first about um, what cultural events Barbara might have been influenced by. And, you know, we talked about this a lot last week with the Tchaikovsky, whether there's extra musical meaning from the composer's life or what's going on in the world at that time and place. And definitely, I mean, you can't separate Shostakovich from, um, you know, the repressive fascist re regime under which he was existing, right? His music wouldn't even make sense if you thought of it as pure music and didn't take into consideration his time and place and circumstances. But Barber, okay, so he was in Europe. He was in Switzerland when he wrote these first two movements. It was 1939. It was, you know, the things were leading up to the war. He did have to come home because Americans were advised to evacuate, but I honestly don't hear anything angsty in here, anything dark and foreboding. Um, yeah, there's a couple of deep, you know, moments, but I don't, I honestly can't associate that with, with the, the, you know, impending war. It, it doesn't make sense to me with this piece. This piece feels so so open and warm and optimistic and friendly and and just lush and you know everything great that we associate with that sort of american sound as we're getting the zoom set up you can linger on for a moment at our concerts i know they have some merch up and good stuff like that and you can think about which concertos you want to send me questions for for the upcoming episodes and i'll see you in a few minutes on zoom thanks for watching